So can we then, maybe we can just talk about the procedure, how we are right now working with this new kind of program here in the Association of Africans living in Vermont, who have been kind enough to give us space and the technology to do these events. What, we, what the attempt is to do, this is also sponsored by the Caroline Fund and by, the, by a new institution, which we are trying to instigate here in Burlington, called Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement. And that's the board members are, some of them are here. Beth is one of the board members, Robin as well, uh, Lou Andrews as well, and me. And the Caroline Fund is a foundation that was started when one of my daughters was murdered actually in a, in a domestic violence situation. And we put this fund together for two purposes to help women and their families if, with a small crisis, a financial crisis. We also have uh, increasingly have an educational mission as well to try to educate people about violence in general and about the rights of citizens and the rights of defendants. And that's what we're doing today. And I wanna thank the African Association for sponsoring this and the Attorney General's Office and the Caroline Fund and also Vicki for, for helping to create a program where we could at least talk about the law and the effects of the law and how to understand it. One thing, I'm a lawyer, my name is Sandy Barrett. I've been a lawyer for a very long time and I've noticed more and more how very few people even understand what the law is, what it purports to be, and how it is implemented. I was especially interested in, in the hearings of the recent appointment of Judge Amy Comey Barrett to the Supreme Court. I watched all those hearings. I happened to find them interesting in the legal discussions. Most people were very upset about that, I would say, but I found them really fascinating. And that's one of the reasons that last week or two weeks ago, we had a whole talk here about the US Supreme Court uh, given to us by one of the attorney generals. I noticed that Julio Thompson from the attorney general's office has just joined us. And so, yeah. I, okay, hi, thank you for coming. Julio, did you have any difficulties getting in? Uh, no, it was just a matter of, uh, of just logging in and setting up the video, so. Great, thanks. Thank you for coming. And again, thank your whole office for helping to set this up. And so I will introduce Julio. As I mentioned, the, the reason for this talk is to try to give some education about what people should do when they're stopped by the police and what they have to do and what they don't have to do. Because many, many people get stopped by the police, particularly people, brown and black people, and uh, in Vermont, they, that has been reported to be uh, escalating and, uh, and has escalated for African Americans in particular, but of course also new Americans um, and immigrants. So take it away, Julio. You are from the Civil Rights Division, right? Of the Attorney General's office, right? So nice to okay. see you. So I, anyway, the floor, is, so to speak, is yours. Hi, everybody. How are you this evening? I hope you're doing okay. Thumbs up. Um, so I'll just briefly describe who I am and, and what I do in the Attorney General's office. Um, so we have different divisions in the office that enforce different laws. Um, we have a unit within the Attorney General's office that's called the Civil Rights Unit. I'm the director of that unit. We enforce a number of, of laws that relate to the protection of Vermonters. Um, which would include, for example, uh, hate crimes cases. Some people um, call our office and have questions about what, uh, particularly when they're confronting speech, either in person or online, what speech is, is criminal and what's not. Um, I also teach the, uh, the hate crimes class at the Vermont Police Academy, and I've done that twice a year. There are two academies per year, so for the last Rough, I think maybe going on 10 years now, uh, any officer who's been working for 10, 10 years or fewer in Vermont has at least been through uh, and has gone through the Vermont Academy, has gone through uh, my hate crimes class. We also do some follow up training um, with prosecutors or, um, or law enforcement officers about uh, Vermont's hate crime laws. We also enforce Vermont's laws that relate to employment discrimination, which can include various types of harassment. 
Um, we do not, uh, when people have complaints about the police, under Vermont law, um, the, uh, the legislature uh, gave the authority to investigate complaints of discrimination by police to the Vermont Human Rights Commission, uh, not to our office. Um, and so when we receive those, uh, those inquiries, if someone says, I think I was racially profiled, or I think I was stopped or searched because of who I am or what I look like, uh, and it was unfair, um, we'll usually direct them to the Human Rights Commission which can, you know, take the complaint and uh, if, if there looks like there may be a violation of the laws against discriminating against Vermonters, then, um, then the Human Rights Commission would take that. Um, but we do deal with a lot of the constitutional rights uh, of Vermonters um, that, that come into play um, when you're interacting with, with the police. So, um, we're involved all the time in cases or investigations uh, regarding whether um, uh, individuals have the right to free speech in certain circumstances, when they have the right to remain silent, when they have the right to be uh, free from uh, unreasonable searches um, by the government, uh, as well as um, uh, it, and no less important, but often not discussed in this context, uh, amendment, which is the 14th Amendment, which is the right to equal protection under the laws. Mm -hmm. So um, I myself in the Civil Rights Unit and probably, um, oh gosh, uh, probably right now I'm, we're on 10 or 15 federal lawsuits that are asserting the constitutional rights of Vermonters as well as other Americans that might come up in different contexts such as uh, immigration. So um, we were we were part of the successful DACA lawsuit uh, that the Supreme Court decided uh, in the in, in favor of the Dreamers um, earlier this year. Um, we were also uh, successful before the Supreme Court in the lawsuit to uh, challenge uh, efforts to place immigration related questions on the census, which we knew would depress participation. Um, in the census, which has a direct effect on Vermonters, right. not only in terms of political representation, but also in terms of um, all sorts of valuable information, including public health information, you know, where our seniors are, where our young children are, um, it has effect on federal dollars and the like. So uh, we've been doing this work for a long time. Um, and, uh, you know, today's topic, um, uh, has always been important to people. I know that there's been a lot, uh, uh, and I think right, uh, rightfully so, um, there's been a lot of attention on police conduct over the summer and into the fall. Um, but our own experience in the Civil Rights Unit and working with our colleagues uh, in other states or other parts of the, or Vermont is that these issues affect the Vermonters all the time. Um, and um, it's great that more people are being aware of it because I think we will, um, you know, we will uh, end up with better outcomes and results on the roads or in people's uh, houses if they have contact with the police in their houses. Um, and anytime uh, uh, folks are more aware of their rights and are able to assert those rights uh, clearly is a way to, um, you know, reinforce the culture that, that we're part of in this country and Vermont. And so um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not an effort to be antagonistic, but just to say, look, here, here's what I understand my rights are and I'd like to assert them. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, some of the rights that come into play when people come into contact with law enforcement. Most people come in contact with law enforcement, usually through a traffic stop. So I'd like to start with those rights that, that come into play. Uh, and then the next most frequent contact that Vermonters may come into contact with, and Vermont is just on the street or on the sidewalk, either, um, you know, just as they're conducting their own business, or maybe they're part of a protest or observing a protest, or maybe even observing another police stop. We'll talk about uh, the rights that might apply there. Uh, and then finally, we'll talk about um, uh, your rights 
as it relates to police officers coming to your home or where you live or where you're staying. And um, uh, by, by that time, uh, we will have covered most of the rights that already apply to you, uh, but then talk about some specific rights that apply when you're talking about uh, officers who want to talk to you or and, and or ask consent to come in or, or serve a warrant and the like. Along the way, we're going to talk about some of the more recent developments in the law that relate to digital evidence. For example, when can a police officer take your cell phone? When can they search your cell phone? Uh, can they make you show things on your cell phone and those sorts of things? Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, it's not um, some of those issues are um, very very recent the US Supreme Court has been deciding those cases maybe five or ten years after the technology that arrives so they're they're slowly catching up um, and then we also if we have time we'll also talk about some of the frontiers about the interaction between law enforcement and the public and that has to do with things like facial recognition um, in Vermont and, in, and and nationally for people who have family in other states. What are your rights when it comes to, um, what are your rights, if any, when it comes to have your face uh, scanned and, and digitized into some sort of database, which then might be used as part of a criminal investigation or something else. And we'll have time for questions for all of that. Um, so uh, before I get started on traffic stops, though, um, if there are any questions about what I've described about what I do or what we do and or the topics, I'd be happy to, to take those now. Well, I, I, I just yes. I have a technical thing to interrupt here for a second. Could you just tilt your screen down, please? Because we're recording this. And we're, yes, um, that's a little bit better. Thank you so much. Sure. Well, that was Megan O'Rourke from CCTV Town Meeting Television. And she's recording this and we'll broadcast this later on Channel 17 in Burlington. And we're going to have okay. a lower third underneath you, and I don't want it cutting off your chin. Okay. Great. Thanks so much. All right. Sure. Uh, any other questions? Um, and, and Sandy, should we? I may not be able for my screen to see hands. Okay. Uh, that, that are I can. I'll. I'll yeah, I can. Okay. okay. So let's just talk about um, let's just talk about traffic stops. And, and the way I want to um, start that is really to uh, look at the traffic stops as an orient to get ourselves thinking about that encounter with law enforcement is to think about um, your position between behind two different steering wheels. The first steering wheel is your own your own car if you're the driver of the car. And let's uh, let's start right now and just assume that you're alone in the car. But I also want you to think uh, for a moment about uh, what things may look like to the officer from behind their steering wheel uh, when they may see a violation and decide to pull you over. Um, uh, starting from the officer's perspective, um, and, and I may explain some of the conduct or the behavior of a law enforcement officer when you see them. Uh, in Vermont, it's often it's one officer uh, who's initiating a traffic stop. You may see if you're looking through your rear view mirror, for example, the off and at night, the officer may have an awful lot of uh, an awful lot of uh, white light, you know, that's um, beaming, and you may have his high beams on and have his side beams on, and blasting out a, a lot of light into the car, um, and it may well be directed directly into your mirror. That's intentional for a couple of reasons. One, it's to allow the officer to see as much as they can see inside the car to see where your hands are. And see whether there's anything that's that could be a potential threat in the car uh, and it's also uh, to make it tougher for you if you have bad intentions for you to be able to spot the officer and if you are uh, you know let's say you had a weapon you were a bad person and you were you had a firearm and you were thinking about firing at the officer it's a lot tougher uh, for you to uh, confront those lights it takes your decision making is slowed down um, because uh, you have tougher visibility. Uh, it's annoying when it happens, certainly when uh, you get lit up, so to speak, at night. Um, but that's the reason the officers are doing it. Um, typically in a traffic stop, you don't want the officer to have any reason to be afraid of you. Officers who are afraid are, uh, are, gonna, are going to be um, 
thinking about using force, maybe if they are if they have to defend themselves mm -hmm. and react very quickly. So usually at nighttime, a, a lot of folks recommend, and I would generally agree with this, is that turn your dome light on, turn off your engine, turn your dome light on so that the officer can see inside your car. Uh, you don't want the officer to have a suspicion or a mistaken belief that your cell phone that's on your passenger seat uh, is a weapon. You just want to have uh, you want to give the officer that that visibility. Another thing you may see an officer do as they approach the car is they may put, you may feel the car move a little bit. The officer may put their hand on the trunk of your car and push down. Uh, pretty much every police officer in the U.S. is taught um, that when you approach a car and you're going by a trunk, you need to know whether that trunk is open or not, whether there's somebody in the trunk, uh, if there's a potential threat, because there are people who, you know, who may be inside of it, you know, you don't know who you're coming up against. And so an officer may pat the car. They may also do that on your door as well, to touch your door to make sure it's secure so that if someone's deciding to try to get out and maybe create a threat, they have to go through the additional step of opening the door rather than pushing an already door, open door. Um, those are little things that uh, if you have the bad fortune of being stopped, uh, for a traffic violation, you may observe an officer doing, uh, and and it's pretty standard training, but it also is a, a little window into the orientation of how they're trained, really from the first day at the academy, which is that they have to be ready to react to situations where they don't know uh, who's in the car, they don't know what their intentions are, they don't know if they're armed, uh, and they do a lot of training on that. Um, because uh, officers are trying to um, carry out their job. And when, if you were, imagine you can visualize walking to a car at night, if you were an officer walking up on a car and you come to the window and the first thing you may notice when you look at it is that usually you can't see the person's hands uh, if their hands are on their lap. And so um, that creates a little bit of tension for police officers because uh, they know that, you know, a hand is, you know, if there's a weapon or if there's a threat, it's going to come from the hands. Uh, and so a lot of folks do recommend that, um, you know, if you have a traffic stop and, and the officer's coming up in your car, turn off your keys, put your hands on the steering wheel, uh, just make sure they're comfortable. And then that way the officer, again, doesn't have to start entering into that mental calculation is like, where is it, are the hands a threat? If your hands are on the steering wheel, um, it's gonna place the officer in a little safer mindset. And again, uh, you're gonna be nervous, but I can also tell you, especially for nighttime stops, um, you know, a lot of times law enforcement officers are nervous as well because they don't know what they're coming upon. Uh, when you are there and the officer does uh, contact you, um, uh, you know, they do have the right in, in Vermont to, uh, to ask you for your license, uh, your registration and proof of insurance. There's a Vermont law that says that uh, as part of the privilege of operating or getting a driver's license that you agree to provide that basic form of identification. Um, but related to that is that you don't have to really say anything else. Um, the officer says, how you going? Where you, hey, where are you going tonight? You don't have to say anything at all to the officer. You just basically have to give them the information to identify yourself. Um, depending on the, the officer's particular training or the culture of a police department, some officers might ask why, ask you why uh, you think they stopped you. You know, why do you think, do you have any reason why I stopped you tonight? Uh, and they may say it in a very, a very friendly way. Um, you know, the honest answer is that you don't, you probably don't know why they stopped um, because you don't have access to their decision-making. Um, some officers and, uh, Again, it's kind of an old practice that I think is uh, is on the way out, but you still see it where officers will do that. Um, they're not really engaging in friendly chit chat. They're trying to see whether they can get you, you to admit to a traffic violation. So if you blew a stop sign and the officer says, do you know why I stopped you tonight? And you say, I guess, because I didn't stop at the stop sign, they have an admission that you violated the vehicle code. And for a lot of law enforcement officers, and I think next year in Vermont universally, uh, it'll, be, uh, it'll be recorded. So you, you should assume that 
uh, whether you can tell or not that your encounter is being recorded. Um, so, you know, you don't have to tell the officer. Uh, you might have a hunch why they stopped you, but you're not required to tell them anything under the Fifth Amendment. Uh, to the Constitution, uh, the U.S. Constitution, and also under Article 11 of Vermont's own state constitution, you don't have, to, you have the right to remain silent. Um, and so, um, you know, a lot of, a lot of folks would just say, you know, just don't really engage in that. Say, I don't know. No, I don't know why you stopped. How can I help you? Um, and, and be polite. Um, the officers don't, if the officer asks you, where are you going, where you're coming from? You don't have to answer. That doesn't mean you shouldn't answer. Uh, I think people can decide on their own. But the, when we're talking about people's rights, the important thing is that you don't have to answer at all. Um, sometimes the officers are doing that as a way of just seeing whether you are uh, nervous or whether, uh, or if you seem excessively nervous, they're trying to see if there's a reason for it. So they may have an investigative orientation. Some officers are just being friendly. Um, it's hard to tell, but um, it's always true. And, and I think most people already know this, but you know, when you speak to law enforcement voluntarily, anything you say uh, could be used as evidence against you later. Um, and so um, you, you don't have access to why the officer is asking you, but you do know, or you should at least proceed out of the assumption that A, your, your encounter with law enforcement is recorded and B, that they may play, if they decide to charge you with something, uh, they can roll tape and anything you say or how you say it um, can be played back in a court. Um, and so um, uh, that's, an important, uh, that's an important thing. Officers are allowed, um, uh, and this, when I was in law school, this was a little hard for me to swallow um, it, when I discovered this, but when officers are doing an investigation, Let's say it could be that they, they stopped you not because you violated the traffic law. It could be just that you that you and your car match the description of someone who's wanted for a crime. Uh, and that might be, and if it's a close enough match, that might be enough, that might be enough basis for them to stop you. Uh, and now they're going to be talking to you um, uh, to figure out whether you know you're the person they that they want. Um, and uh, courts have said for a long time that officers are allowed to engage in a bit of deceit. Um, so if they ask you uh, for information and um, and you don't provide it, uh, or if they are asking you um, or telling you why they stopped you and it's not the real reason they stopped you, it could be that you know they you were speeding, but it's also true that they really want to know whether you're the car that was near the you know the robbery last night. Um, so they may tell you that, yeah, well, you know, you were speeding a little bit and that's why it stopped you. So if you just talk to me, you know, you may just end up with a warning uh, and I'll let you go. And that doesn't have to be true uh, for the officer. Um, in contrast, it is, it is a misdemeanor in Vermont for you to give false statements to an officer in order to uh, either uh, point blame at somebody else or to evade uh, any kind of uh, blame for anything that you might have done. For example, uh, if they ask you, you know, uh, do you have any open, is there any open alcohol in the car? Uh, and you choose to, and you answer that question and you lie about it. Um, and they later find out that you're lying about it. You can be charged not only for the open container violation, but also uh, for a misdemeanor for, um, for giving false statements to an officer. Can I interrupt for a minute, Julio? So, sure. if, but that's not perjury, though, right? Because it's not under oath. It's, it's not under oath, so right. it's a less serious offense. Right. A misdemeanor in Vermont law basically means the maximum punishment they can give you is mm -hmm. up to one year in jail. Uh, perjury is typically a felony, which is more than one year in jail. Right. As a practical matter, people don't serve a year. But that's the distinction when people talk about this was a felony or this was a misdemeanor. Typically in the US, and, and it's generally true in Vermont, the dividing line is the maximum amount you could, you could spend behind bars, and that's one year. Um, so, um, you know, so if you, are in the, if you are in a position where 
um, you're worried about what you're saying to something in law enforcement may create more trouble to you. Um, the law is pretty clear that you're better off not saying anything right. rather than lying about it. Um, so, uh, like I said, the Constitution gives you the right to stay silent. It doesn't give you the rights to lie uh, during, you know, an investigative stop or or, or an enforcement stop. Um, and um, officers may, uh, you know, may ask you things that um, may be obvious to you, and you, again, you can decide whether you want to answer them or not. Some Sometimes officers will say things that might be troubling and it might be indicative of bias. Like they might ask uh, someone, do you have any weapons in the car? Um, asking someone whether, whether they have a weapon in a car is not a legal violation uh, for the officer. They can ask you um, many things um, under the law, but that doesn't mean you have to answer them. Um, so, um, and, and you know, if you don't have any weapons in the car that, and you want to say, no, I don't have any, I don't have any weapons in the car, um, you know, that's up to you. We don't uh, tell people, you know, how they should handle every interaction. But it's clear that, if, you know, if you responded to that by saying, you know what, I don't really feel comfortable talking to you other than giving you my, my identification, uh, you know, um, you can't be charged for refusing to answer the question. That, mm -hmm. That's, that's not allowed under the state or federal constitution. Um, you also um, have the right, and, and this is where Vermont law is a little different than federal law. You do have the right uh, in Vermont uh, to stay inside your car uh, unless the officer uh, has a basis for like a safety related basis or unless the officer is gonna arrest you uh, for making you step out of the car. Um, uh, a little over 10 years ago, maybe 15 plus years ago, that issue came up before the Vermont Supreme Court. For many years under the federal constitution, the, the US Supreme Court uh, kind of balancing your privacy interest in staying in the car versus the officer's safety interest in removing somebody from the car so you can see where they are and they won't, you know, they close the car door behind them and they won't have access to weapons. The U.S. Supreme Court has said, you know, an officer uh, can do that and won't violate someone's right to an unreasonable search. It's a relatively minor intrusion, uh, and it's you know, and it would enhance, it would make encounters safer for law enforcement officers and the public. Um, uh, and and they came up in a case where there was an officer literally whose pol his practice was every single person he stopped. He made them get out of the car and close the car door behind them. And then he took their license and, and information and, and wrote the citation while they were standing in the Supreme Court, US Supreme Court, so that they didn't violate the federal constitution. But in Vermont, the issue came up uh, and it was, it was a different result. The Vermont Supreme Court looked at our state constitution, which, is, uh, which gives Vermonters some greater protections than the federal constitution does. Uh, and the Supreme Court said that now you really, the officer is really going to need to be able to identify a safety related reason why they can't uh, carry out uh, that, you know, their transaction, writing a ticket, et cetera, while you're in the car. But there are all sorts of inconveniences that could occur to people. It can be cold out. People can be afraid uh, just to be pulled out of the car. That That's a frightening experience for people. And the Vermont Supreme Court, uh, said in that case, and, and they reaffirmed it only three years ago in a different case, that um, that's not a minimal intrusion on people's rights. So um, you're always able to ask the officer a question about why they're doing something. Um, that's the First Amendment um, that allows you a freedom of speech. You can ask someone, you know, so why are you stopping me, officer? Uh, if the officer asks you why you have to step out of the car, you're, you're allowed to ask them why. Um, they're not required under the law to tell you, however. It may be that their policy, a lot of police departments um, will have a policy that says that, you know, unless it's going to jeopardize your investigation, if someone asks you why they're being stopped, you tell them. Uh, and if someone says, well, why are you doing this? You tell them the answer unless the officer can articulate some reason um, uh, why they think that might create a safety risk. For example, 
if someone matches up the uh, you know to the description of someone suspected in a bombing or a shooting uh and the officer stops a car with a broken taillight um and then wants to talk with the person and maybe ask them more questions uh and if the officer says well answers and says well you know frankly i'm not sure if you're the bomber or not that might be create a safety risk for the officer um, and so most police department policies will say, well, you know, if it's going to make it unsafe for you, or you think you're, it's going to make it unsafe for you, you don't have to answer. But you can always, but you can always ask. Um, and um, in the context of being asked outside of the car, if you're asking, so why are you, why are you taking my out of the car? Why can't we do this uh, in the car? Um, that's not going to be, that's not going to create legal jeopardy for you. Um, how the officer reacts to that kind of depends upon the officer. Certainly just asking in a calm voice uh, out of curiosity or concern, I think is, is going to be fine. But in Vermont, um, you know, if, if an officer does ask you out of the car, um, probably, you know, I would, you know, I would be thinking, yeah, this is more, this is about more than a broken taillight. He thinks somehow I'm unsafe to him. And so maybe I'm going to conduct myself a little differently to, to alleviate any sort of doubts that I'm some sort of threat to the officer. Or it could be, you know, an officer who is behind in their training and is not doing a good job. Uh, and if it were, you know, I were inconvenienced about that, that might be something I take up later with the department about why I was ordered out of the car. Um, but that's, that's one case where the Vermont, um, where Vermont is different. Another thing that you might experience um, in a traffic stop, especially at night, is you might see that officer, and maybe you've already seen it, the officer will have a flashlight. They're usually holding it up with the light at the end here, uh, and they're shining it in the, to the back seat of your car. Um, folks, I think, can guess why they're doing that. There are two reasons, really. One, to find out who else is in the car. Um, if Again, from a safety perspective, Officers are thinking two people are more dangerous to me than one person. Three people are a lot more dangerous to me than one person. So I want to know who's in the car. Uh, you'll see them doing it in the daylight if a car has, has tinted windows as well. Uh, another reason is that the officer might, even though they have reason to stop you for a broken taillight, they're still allowed under the Constitution to, you know, to investigate whatever they can see and quote, plain view. So if they see someone tied up in the back seat uh, with rope and, a, and tape over their mouth, um, uh, they're permitted to act upon that information if it's visible. Or if they see um, uh, evidence, you know, other evidence of a, of a crime or, what, or, or possession of something that looks like it's illegal contraband, they can, uh, that, that may give them ad additional evidence to conduct a search of the car or to arrest you. Um, so that's why they're doing it. They want to know what's inside the car. One, to be safe, but two, also because they're allowed to do that um, and they're in, in the investigation business, so they're likely to do that. Um, one thing they can't do, uh, this gets into the area of searches, one thing they can't do is ask you to move things around in the car to give them a better view. Um, so uh, they couldn't order you, for example, if let's say you or you were coming back from a party and you had a big tray of food uh, that was covered by a big kitchen towel. Um, you know, they can't, they couldn't make you uncover that tray to see what's underneath that. They can look and see what they can see in plain view. But when they're asking you to move things around that aren't otherwise visible to anybody, you know, anybody who would just come up to your window uh, you're really getting into the territory of the search, and they need to have probable cause to conduct that search. So before I start talking about searches, uh, I'll take a quick moment if there are any questions about what I've talked about in connection with your right to remain silent. Are there any questions about that? Yeah, Pam, Pam has a question. Pamela. Uh, my question, Julio, is, um, I, I frequently drive uh, undocumented migrants, uh, usually brown skinned. And um, uh, if I'm stopped and the officer says, oh, 
I see uh, someone, you have a passenger, and is that person a citizen? Uh, may I see his or her papers? Yeah. So I want to know, uh, I'm the driver, right? I'm a yeah. white skinned driver. Uh, so what yeah. are, what's the best thing for me to do at that point? Well, I can talk about what you're allowed to do. Uh, and then I, I mean, and then I'll, well, you can talk in on case by case, you can decide what, you know, what is best for you in this situation. Um, Vermont law doesn't require you unless the officer has reason to believe that the two of you, like in a traffic stop, if you're the operator of the vehicle, the officer doesn't have any uh, rights to demand that your passengers produce any sort of identification, okay. period. Um, the exception to that would be maybe if the two of you matched the description of people that were, you know, there was a report of people who had just committed a crime. So that would be different. But if you're just talking about a traffic stop, so why am I being stopped? Well, I'm stopping you because you ran the speed limit, you were 10 over in a 45 zone, and that's why I'm stopping you. And then he starts asking questions about the identification of your passengers who have not operated the vehicle, you know, you don't, they don't have to answer at all. Um, they, they have a Fifth Amendment right uh, being on U.S. soil, and they have a right as a Vermonter being on Vermont soil not to answer uh, questions from that law enforcement officer. Furthermore, um, uh, for all Vermont law enforcement departments, even though there, it's not a crime for them to ask. There is a statewide policy standard that they have to meet that that includes a prohibition on law enforcement officers in Vermont. So we're talking about state or local police uh, or sheriffs or deputies uh, from asking someone's immigration status uh, unless it's relevant to a criminal investigation. They have to be able to articulate later on if if that's if there's a complaint to avoid discipline or even more serious consequences, depending on, on the fact pattern, um, for them to be able to articulate why you're asking. Um, so um, okay. regardless of whether you're a citizen or not, I mean, whether they're a citizen or not has nothing to do with the traffic violation. And, and Vermont does not have a show your papers uh, law uh, here. In fact, Vermont, um, many years ago under a different administration, uh, Vermont was part of um, a legal challenge to a show you papers law that uh, the state of Arizona att attempted to enact, where um, they would uh, require everybody to show some proof of, uh, of lawful residence or not. Um, mm -hmm. And that and that law was um, uh, was overturned by the U.S. Supreme Court. Okay, um, that was a Vermont case as well. I mean, it was not. It was not. We filed. Our office filed a front of the court brief uh, under our prior attorney general uh, in support of the legal challenge to that law, and, and the Supreme Court uh, agreed with our arguments, which is that uh, state and local law enforcement officers are not authorized to enforce civil immigration law. If you are unlawfully present in the country, uh, and that's your only offense, uh, that's a civil offense. That's not arrestable. Um, so if you were a student and you were here on an expired visa, um, the fact that you remained in the country is not something that a Vermont law enforcement officer can arrest you on. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and, and for that reason, and also because we want Vermonters to be able to trust their interactions with our state and local police officers. Um, that you know, it's been emphasized in the statewide uh, fair and impartial policing policy that you don't ask. Uh, there may be cases where um, asking someone about where they're from uh, might be relevant to um, it. You know, to to maybe helping them out. It could be that in a traffic stop, the officer has some reason to believe that there might be, the passenger might be there un, unwillingly. Mm -hmm. Someone who's being trafficked, for example. Uh, but those are pretty rare cases. And um, 
Uh, and I and I would assume that it wouldn't be something that you would be you would be involved in, in any event. But um, oh, yeah, well, the officers are, are are told in their policy, don't ask unless you can establish that that somehow is an element of a crime that you're authorized to investigate. Okay, Pamela. Yeah, yeah. just just to clarify. So as as the uh, driver, um, I could simply say um, I have the right to remain, remain silent, right? If someone has a direct question, some some officer who's not been well trained, as you say, would that that be appropriate for me to say, right? Well, I mean, if the officer, you have the right to remain silent. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and, and a passenger has a right to remain silent. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I can say those things, and I'll and that would handle the situation, right? It should. Well, it yeah. depends. I would in that situation, I would know what your passenger wants. It's their right, not your right, to assert it on yeah. their behalf. We've already talked. We already talked about it prior to, so I, I know right. his or her desires. Mm -hmm. Well, then you can you can relay that to them, especially if there's a language barrier, yeah. um, as sometimes there are with uh, different, um, you know, visitors to or or, or newcomers to Vermont. Mm -hmm. um, so that's so that that has to do Thank with you. the um, sure with the right. To, to remain silent. You as a driver, you still have to identify yourself sure. uh, and, and, and provide proof that you're authorized to be on the roads and that you have registration available for the, the car and, and that you're driving. Right. Um, but when it comes to a search, um, this is where I think a lot of people, I'm Who sorry, was there a question? Another question. Who okay, yeah. sure. Yeah. What's, how, would a driver yeah. I can't hear. I'm sorry. I can't hear the question. Yeah. Are you yep. okay. This is Lou. Hi. Sorry. Um, the question sure. is, how would a driver know if the officer says, um, "Yeah, we there has been a crime, and you kind of your car, and you fit the thing." How do you know if if that's true? Or not? Is he? Can he lie about that as well? Um, it it really depends upon the circumstances. Uh, courts will allow officers to lie. For example, if they tell you that their intent is only to get information, so that you know you'll probably, if you just let me know, you know where you're going, I'll I'll probably let you off with a warning. Um, but if they are lying, if a person says, for example, you know well, I don't consent to your searching a car. And the officer says, well, actually, um, you know, I have, I have reason to search your car, so you might as well sign the form. Uh, and then it turns out that later on, the officer didn't have a reason, um, then his search of the car would be unconstitutional. A court would likely find that your consent wasn't truly voluntary. I'm, I'm about to talk about that, but I guess I can elaborate a little, a little on it now, which is that in order for you to, to waive a constitutional right, it has to be knowing, you know what right you're waiving, and it has to be voluntary. You have to freely give it and not be uh, coerced. Uh, so courts look, when, when it comes to searches, um, where people are asked consent, it, especially in Vermont, Courts are very skeptical about whether that's really a voluntary situation at all. Um, different states, courts have different perceptions about how free people feel. Uh, when an officer says, you mind if I just, if I search your trunk and then we'll be on our way. Uh, Vermont, I think takes, a, historically, uh, the courts take a, a pretty dim view of that. They understand how coercive that can be. People are afraid. This is after all, uh, somebody who may have the legal right to stop you, they've got a gun, uh, they work with other people who have guns who might show up. They have all, you know, uh, th there's all sorts of fears that can arise in the context of that interaction. So court is already maybe inclined to think that it's not so voluntary. But enough, if an officer lies to you about what your right is, and then, uh, and then you consent to a search, the court's likely to find out that wasn't really effective consent. So if they found something, let's suppose that, you know, you gave a ride to somebody last week and then they, 
they left something in the back seat of your car you didn't know anything about. And the officer says, aha, the, what's this? I'm going to arrest you for possession of whatever the item is. Um, that evidence would likely be suppressed uh, if it came to light that the officer um, lied to you about whether you had the right to consent or not. It's not really knowing or, or voluntary. Um, but the, the mere saying of it itself is not a crime. Uh, but it, oftentimes when deceit is used by officers, they may, uh, and, and courts will uphold, they will, um, they will uphold when officers will misrepresent what the consequences are of a search. Um, uh, you know, or like an officer might say, you know, you, um, you mind if I search your car? I'm not, I don't really care about any weed or if you have any beer there. We just want to make sure you don't have any guns so I feel safe. And then they, later on, they find uh, either alcohol or marijuana and, and if they're going to make arrests, they may be more likely uh, to do that because um, they're misrepresenting what you do. And it's sort of like on the TV dramas when they are interrogating people and they say, look, it's just make it easy on yourself. Confess. Yeah. Um, often, you know, look, I'm sure that we're going to, I'm going to go to the prosecutor and recommend that you get probation for this. Uh, courts will up say that's, you know, that's trickery that um, it, it is permitted. Um, but if, but if in an interrogation, using the same TV series, uh, you know, uh, scenario that we're visualizing, if the person says, I want a lawyer, and the, and the, the lawyer says, I mean, the the officer says, you don't have a right to a lawyer. Um, not, not in Vermont, that's, in, that's somewhere else, but Vermont doesn't give you a right to a lawyer. And then they continue to try to get information from you uh, and you relent, then all of that information probably is gonna be thrown out. Cause it's, again, it's coercive. Uh, it's not a knowing waiver of your rights to remain silent because they've lied to, to you about your rights. Um, you're not, I mean, I, I think you're less likely to see that uh, than to see officers who might be deceptive about just saying, hey, look, it's no big deal. I just search your truck and then, or, you know, hey, you know, we do this for everybody. It's just something that we do. This is a dangerous area. It's something that would make me feel a lot better. Uh, when their real intent might be, if I get consent to search a trunk, I search 10 trunks a night, maybe I find something. Uh, maybe I take guns or drugs off the street. So there, there may there may be room for for them to misrepresent why they're asking you to do. Um, but when it comes to misrepresenting what your rights are, um, a court's not likely to take um, to you know to take that uh, to take that seriously. Mm -hmm. um, and, and the officer likely, if there were a complaint made uh, against the officer, likely there would be some consequences for the officer because there's there's, a, there's territory that um, they're expected not to not to go down. Uh, so when we talk about um, searches for cars, again, I talked a little bit about plain view. They can look at what is in your car um, that that anybody walking up to your car would be able to see. Um, but to ask you, um, you know, to get out of the car and to consent uh, to a search, the officer is going to need to have, you know, probable cause either to arrest you for some some uh, arrestable offense. Uh, um, or have some other reason, or maybe they already have a warrant. <clears throat> um, but if they, you know, and so there are there are rules about that strictly govern when officers can can uh, search a car. But if you agree that they can search your car, all of those rules are gone. You basically have signed away all of those rules. And so anything that the officer finds uh, in your car, if you've been, if you've consented to the search. Um, can be used as evidence against you. Uh, and a lot of folks think, well, I don't have anything to hide in my car. Uh, and that's likely true for a lot of people. Um, but there are, there are cases where people give a ride to somebody uh, where something falls out of their pocket or they put something in the car or they have a spouse or someone else in their family, a family member who uses a car. And, you know, you really don't know. But what you do know is that if you consent to the search, um, the officer is free to go through, you know, a fishing expedition and search your car. Um, so generally speaking, people, um, 
feel uncomfortable. People always feel uncomfortable saying no to a police officer. That's why I talked about that coercive um, nature of the encounter uh, that courts have, have recognized. People wonder, well, if I tell them no, you, even if I have a right now, is there, are they going to think I'm up to something? Uh, and that's going to make things worse for me. Uh, well, it may make the officer more suspicious. That's true. That's up to the psychology of the individual officer. But it's also true that you flat out have a right to say no, that I don't consent. Uh, and then the question is how to say that. This is a question we sometimes get. How do you tell an officer that? Um, uh, I've seen some people just recommend, you just say, look, I don't, I don't consent to searches, period. Nothing personal, I understand you're trying to do your job, but it's something I don't do. Uh, rather, it's saying is this is, this is just how I, how I feel about it. So, uh, unless, you know, unless you have a legal reason to do a search without my consent, I, I'd rather, I'd rather you not. And then just, and then just stop talking, uh, right? You have the right to remain silent. The officer might cajole people and they can try to cajole people and persuade them. But if you really don't want the officer to search your car, you can just repeat what you said. And mm -hmm. the fact that you did not consent to a search can't be used against you. You're basically asserting a constitutional right. Um, and um, the, the clearer you say that, uh, the better it is for you if they decide to do a search anyway. And then if there's you know trouble down the road, if there's an arrest or something like that, it'll make it easier for, uh, for you to defend yourself or to defend a member of your family if there are other people in the car um, where you said, look, I don't, I don't consent. Uh, to the search, and then you know your legal representative is going to be able to make the state prove that they actually satisfied the fairly um, stringent requirements to search someone's car. Okay, before we move on, we're getting um, close to the end, actually. Um, okay. Um, and I would ask. I think there are some people from uh, immigration groups. Is that true? Like Pamela, did you have other questions? I mean, you, you deal with the whole asylum questions also, right, Pamela? I had a question, like what if, how does, I, what happens when ICE stops people or do they stop people, do you know? Yeah, that, that, that's a question I would have as well. I've, I've had some training in that, but uh, whatever Julio wants to update us on would be great. Well, what I would say is a couple of things. One, I would say that and I'm not an immigration lawyer. Immigration is a matter of federal law. And the immigration work that our offices does tends to um, involve, um, in, in the last several years, certainly, there have been proposed changes to immigration law or how they've been applied that um, vi violate existing American laws, including the Constitution. So in, in connection with the traffic stop, uh, you know, the Constitution still applies. Uh, there has to be a legal basis for stopping somebody um, that they have to either have seen or have reason to believe that they have violated uh, some law that that officer, whoever it is, has the authority to enforce. Um, and so, um, and everyone has the right to remain silent. Everyone has the right not to consent to searches. Um, but everyone who's operating a motor vehicle has an obligation to, pr to provide proof that they are authorized to drive the vehicle, that there's a registration for the vehicle, and that there's insurance. Um, uh, you know, Vermont has a privilege card, driver's privilege card, which doesn't require people to provide any uh, proof of lawful residence in Vermont in order to provide satisfactory forms of identification. Um, and so that's, you know, any law enforcement officer is required by law to accept that as proof of identity, assuming it, it you know, it is the driver's card uh, and, and not some, you know, someone else's card. Um, but, you know, the same rules basically apply. Um, when, would uh, ICE have, when does, does ICE have the authority to stop anybody in the first place? Well, ICE could stop somebody if they saw them unlawfully crossing the border. I mean, right, if okay. they saw they saw a truck. I think I just read an article not that long ago about someone 
seeing someone drive from Canada across his yard um, and uh, they were caught on the person's motion camera. Um, so crossing the border uh, without authorization is itself a misdemeanor under federal law. But it, to make a misdemeanor arrest, you need to actually see the person doing it. Um, mm -hmm. To say, uh, for an officer to believe that you crossed three days ago is not going to be enough for that officer to arrest you for a misdemeanor. It could be if it's a felony. Like if an officer has an informant who says you robbed the bank a year ago um, and they've got information that seems like it's it's pretty good evidence you know that this informant provided them uh, then you don't have to have witnessed the bank robbery um, but for misdemeanors it's a little bit different so unlawful presence in the u.s on its own is not a, a crime at all um, but crossing the border without authorization it that's a misdemeanor um, and so that, that might be something that they do uh, another area um, I see, I could stop here. There's a question, sure. Okay, yes, uh, Bri, is that your name? I'm sorry. You're muted. Yeah. Uh, I am Bidur Rai, and new immigrant here. I have, it has been just five years that I'm here in the environment from Asia. So, <clears throat> I don't know whether it is, um, uh, it will be perfect time for me to drop down this question or not. But also then I do have a question, uh, curious to land here. That is, is there any possibilities of getting this law um, or rule written in our language? Like I am Nepali. So in Nepali language written and given to this new immigrants so that our immigrants could read that at least and understand. Because I know we are new immigrants. We don't have any experience of driving. We have not driven before. So just when we came here, we had started driving, never knowing all the rules of laws of here. So uh, if there is any way of giving this, you know, translated version or any uh, type of uh, written laws in our language so that we will, our people could understand. I'm uh, really thank you so much for asking that because I'm here at the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, which represents or help, tries to help the whole immigrant community. And the people I try to help them through the legal battles that they sometimes get involved in. And that's a, a need that is really, really on the top of everybody's list is how people from another country. How do they even understand or get any education about the law? I think it's critical for helping people understand what it means to live in the United States. And I really want to work on this. I think you're so right about, I see, for instance, uh, people of your community, the Nepali community, who have been arrested, not arrested, but charged with driving without a license because they didn't know they had to have a license, as you mentioned. To drive a car that's real those, those instances are true and absolutely people of every community need knowledge about the law and they and they need it more and more in their own language but that's why i'm doing this tonight that's why we're doing these kinds of programs is i've become very aware of how many americans and how many new americans don't understand the law or the function of the courts or when they have to be in court, or when they can get arrested, and when they can't get arrested. So this is a, a continuing need, and I'm hoping to try to meet that need through seminars like this. But anyway, thank you for bringing that up. Does anybody thank else have so any other thank questions? Thank you so much. Thank you. Anyone else? So it's, uh, I mean, anybody have any final questions? I'm sorry, Julio, but we don't have a huge amount of time yet left. So okay. I would really like it to open this up for questions in our last few minutes. Anyone? Anyone been stopped by the police lately or we better, not, better not talk about that, eh? Okay, before uh, we end up, I did want to mention that what, what happens, this has happened to me, by the way, a cop comes to my door and wanted to get into the apartment down, I live upstairs, people live downstairs. 
and this cop kept on telling me that they had to go into the, her house. And they've also said that we want to get into your house. I had to fight with that officer a lot to say, you don't have a search warrant. You have no right to be in my house. I was very careful not to say things like, get the hell out, because that would look like I was obstructing the cop or something, and I would have been called in to the police station. So I was very polite, but I finally had to end up saying, get out of my house. You do not have a warrant. So please remember that. I mean, I don't know how you want to address that, but that's true, right? They don't have the right to come in and into your house and search it or anything else without a warrant. Is that true? <laughs> That's that. That's true, and let uh, they generally have to have a warrant to enter your house, uh, unless you consent. If you say, right. "Yeah, you can come in," um, and sometimes that's that happens uh, where people feel like they can't say no. Right. Um, but you know, you you could, if a police officer wanted to talk to you, you could speak them through a you know like a chain door where you have the. The chain latch so that you don't feel like they could step in and maybe it's not really clear whether you allowed them to step in or not or you could just you know exit your front door and close it behind you and say how can i help you no you can't come in if unless you have a warrant there are some minor exceptions to that for example if they were chasing a bank robber and they saw him run into your house uh there are certain exceptions that would allow them to continue running after that person. Uh, but those are really rare and far in between. Um, uh, you know, constitutional law, federally and at the state level, is very protective of people's homes. Um, and so, yeah, they don't have the rights to come in. Um, but if you consent, then, uh, if, if you consent to let them enter your home, um, but you haven't consented to search, then mm -hmm. anything that they can see right. in plain view again, without uncovering anything or looking inside uh, purses or briefcases or backpacks, but just things that they see in there. If they see something in there that might be evidence of a crime, well, then they can use that maybe to arrest you if, if they have reason to connect you with what that right. is. Right. Um, so you're, you're opening that can of worms. But if you say, yeah, you can come in, I'll talk to you in the kitchen. That doesn't give them the right to go through the rest of your house. Right. But if they say, if I want to search your house, then, you know, that's as good as having a search warrant. It's better, in fact, because a judge will often place limits on what can be searched and when. But if you just say, yeah, sure, you can search my house, they, they could be there for a long time. And, and um, if you didn't place any limits on it, they could go through anything. And, and right. that could create a, a mess, even if they don't find anything of interest to them. Right, right. Um, anyway, I think that this is a, a longer discussion to, uh, certainly, I'm sorry that uh, this is only an hour, actually, because it's very yeah. important, as, as Mr. Rye, I don't, I'm sorry, I'm not pronouncing your name correctly, but this is a very important subject, especially for people, I guess, in more urban areas, is what you say to a police officer, how you say it, um, and how, um, what your rights are in front of that police officer, what I would always tell any of my clients or friends or anyone is remember that you are innocent at the time that that police officer stops you and that you do not have to talk. You have the right to remain silent and that you should because anything that you say will be and could be used against you. So but got to be very, very careful about how you deal with police officers. And I would always caution people to be polite because like that time in my house, I was very aware if I got testy that I would be the one that was in jeopardy about that. Um, so anyway, I, do, I know that people don't feel polite when they're stopped by a police officer unjustly, but I think people probably should try as hard as they can not to rile that guy, right? Anyway. Yeah. Anyway, so maybe Julio will come back at another time, but does anybody have any final questions? No? All right, well, thank you so much, Julio. Thank you and sure. thank your office. Remember that this was sponsored by the Caroline Fund, by the Association of Africans Living in Vermont, and by CCTV, who is filming this, and this will be brought 
broadcast later and by the Vermont Institute of Community and International Involvement. And next week, we're gonna be presenting, again from the Attorney General's office, um, an attorney who will talk about the peaceful transition of power and whether or not we're gonna be in that kind of a situation because it will be the night after the election. So try to zoom in, we'll get uh, invitations to everybody. But thank you again for coming. And thank good you night. all, I really appreciate thank it. You. Thanks, Leo. Thank you, Leo. Thank you so much, bye-bye. Good night, everybody. Bye. Bye.